Almost nine out of 10 murder cases in South Africa are not solved. One of those cases is the murder of Pastor Liesel de Jager. With me is Ian Cameron from Action Society SA, the NPO that has taken up this case and so many other unsolved murder cases. Welcome, Ian. Thank you very much, Chris. Looking forward to speaking with you. Please tell me uh, how you became involved in trying to help uh, the police solve the murder of Pastor Liesel de Jager. Uh, so, 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 Chris, what, what happened with this case, I, I think what stood out to us was when we started hearing the, uh, the lack of progress, the lack of feedback. It, it actually almost felt like a lack of empathy. It, it wasn't so much the, um, the, the, the feedback issue. We know the police are under pressure. We know all of those things. We know about the DNA backlog, et cetera, et cetera. We understand the resource shortage. What, what hit me, and I, I saw it in the media for the first time, um, uh, what hit me was it, it felt like there was no compassion for the state for what was happening to people. It, it almost seemed like Liesel was just a number to them. And I thought, this can't be. I mean, we've got, we've got many cases that Action Society is involved with, um, not only doing the investigation, but also doing oversight and court and et cetera. Um, and it just feels like there's a total loss for, of, of compassion and empathy for not only the families, but but the victims, giving them a sense of dignity, even though they have passed on, and, and giving the family some kind of closure. It's just as though that's completely lost. What challenges uh, have your investigators faced trying to help the police solve this case? I, I know, I think you've been involved uh, for nine months now, if I'm... <laughs> Yes, yeah. So, so saw it in the media. Reached out to uh, to Hink van Sale, um, Liesel's father, and and said, "Look, we want to help." And and at first, he he said to me, "But you know, he he does feel frust frustrated, but uh, you know, we need to give the police a fair chance to do their thing, and and so on and so forth." And and the more we spoke, he eventually said, "Look, I want to I want to mandate you to to start also following it up. That that I'm not." But I'm not just a, a, a lone wolf trying to solve this. And um, and then, Chris, we really went the extra mile. I mean, we sent a, a very experienced investigator to meet with the police. We offered help. We spoke to uh, commanding officers. We said that, you know, is there is there anything else we can assist with? We spoke with a, with a detective uh, a branch head uh, at, at the station. Um, we spoke with people in the provincial office of the police. We said, if there's anything, we'll even do statements. If we have to transport people, we will do that. If there's any private capacity that you need in terms of the forensic investigation, we will do that too, because we've got experienced people um, that come from a forensic background. If you need us to trace suspects, uh, we will do that too. In fact, we will even build a docket for you on your behalf and you can literally just tick the boxes, make sure everything is done, and uh, and and do the rest. If you need us to transport suspects to uh, the uh, prosecutor, we will do that as well. Uh, you just name it, anything you need us to do, obviously within the framework of the law, we will assist with. And you know what? Uh, they kept on giving these uh, these very very accommodating answers of, of yes, thank you, but we're, we're busy with it. We'll get there and, and we'll follow up or we'll we'll meet with you. And then they either don't show up or they never come back with feedback or they have got some kind of excuse. Um, and it just became so frustrating. And, and uh, we just recently decided that's it. We, we're done being uh, accommodating. We're sick and tired of just being seen as as numbers. And I mean, obviously, I understand the the family's point of view, and that they want justice for Liesel, and I obviously do too. But from an action society point of view, this is the trend that's increasing throughout the country. That that victims are just they are just that they are just it's just another victim. Don't worry, it's just another murder. Uh, it's it's kind of normal, and we can never ever ever allow that to become the norm. So you basically offered to do all the work for the police in this particular case, and they blew you off. Uh, so it can't be overwork 
uh, that is the excuse here. If they were overworked, they would have accepted your help. Yeah, you know, there's one of two things that stands out to me, and 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 these are these are uh, you know from from my personal point of view, I honestly think it's it's either um, uh, actually three things. It's either incompetence, uh, a lack of interest, or corruption. It's one of those three things, and uh, I stand to be proved wrong. But we have got so many cases where dockets go missing or where similar things happen where corruption is involved. So I can't help but ask that question. Was there any form of corruption in this case? Because this is not a complicated murder investigation. In fact, uh, from what I've seen regarding the investigation and the people that I've spoken with, including Hink, um, uh, it is it really is not complicated. There are many, many simple things that could have been done already by the police to solve this, uh, this crime. And... Uh, I must ask if there's if 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 not complicit, uh, it it must be a lack of interest. Um, it, it you know have we have we come to the point where we can kill people in South Africa, and if that victim is not politically connected, they they have no justice whatsoever. Um, you know, it, it, I I actually want to go as far as saying that that the family is lucky that they got a case number. We've, we've got a few investigations where month passes and the family don't even get a case number. Are you talking so, about murders? Uh, uh, murder murder cases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, we took on a case last week in Alexandra and Joburg where a, a, a person was, was murdered and the firearm that was used was a firearm that was handed back to the suspect after a previous arrest when he got bailed. They gave the firearm back to him after he had used it uh, uh, whilst committing a crime. And, then and whilst he committed a murder with it. He committed a murder, and, and the police then tried to persuade the uh, victim's spouse to open a case against the deceased uh, to, to insinuate that the deceased had posed a threat to her. And she said no. And then the police picked her up at her house. They took her to the police station and they said, you will open a case. And this little lady, I mean, she's far, she's tiny. Uh, when I met with them last week in, in, in Alex, we walked up to her shack and she's minute. She just stood. She said, no, I will not open a case. This is a matter of principle. I will not, I will not give in. I will not open a case. This is cold blooded murder. And uh, and and the police to this day have done nothing. He was murdered two months ago, um, and there are many more examples like that. So, Chris, the, the police in Liesel the Archer's case have no excuse whatsoever. There is no excuse. We've asked that it be given to the provincial office. We've even asked that the case be referred to the national office of the police to have it investigated from there because of the lack of progress, and. They just say no. It must be done on local level. Now, if there's if there's a resource shortage, surely they can see why it needs to be transferred to a different office to solve it, especially because it's been delayed for so long. And then I must ask, what what is? And I'm going to say this very bluntly: the leadership is is absolutely use, useless. There's no doubt, um, because according to my uh, according to my experience and and from my point of view, any good leader. Um, regardless of how se- what a senior rank they are, anyone that oversees this matter would see, but there's something very wrong there, and we need to intervene. But they don't even have the integrity to do such a basic thing. So how do we expect change on ground level with regards to policing and crime if they can't even do something that simple? So we're sitting with a situation where it's it's no longer crime and punishment. It is just crime. Yeah, Um you, you said the correct statistic, 9 out of 10. It's, it's 14.5% to be exact, according to the Institute for Security Studies' recent report that they released. Uh, so, so only 14.5% of murders are solved. That's shocking, eh? That means, uh, 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 that means that today, according to the latest crime stats, we've got 84 murders a day in South Africa. That's 3.5 murders per hour. Um, so let's round it off uh, to 4 murders per hour in the country. That means out of that 4 murders it's likely that not even one of them will be solved. That, that's, how, that, that's how horrific it is. So you and I can literally walk out, we can shoot and kill someone, and if I don't hand myself over to the police, chances are that I'll walk free. And not, you not, do. not, if you do hand yourself yeah. over, the case may not actually be lead yeah. to a successful I, prosecution. Exactly. I can actually ask them, 
uh, not to give me bail and they will give me bail. That's how broken the system is. And I, and I often get the excuse from the police that, yeah, but it's the prosecutor. But then when we speak with the prosecutor and we look, we, we, we um, inquire about the dockets, the prosecutor just says, I can't prosecute someone if I don't have a docket that makes any sense. There's nothing written in there. There's zero logic in that docket. I mean, half of our police, uh, uh, the especially newer recruits, don't even have the skill to write properly. How on earth are they going to testify in court? Or oppose bail in court. Now, um, where do the families of murder victims turn if they can no longer trust the police to do a proper investigation? I know people, many, many, many people turn to you, but but you you are getting so many cases that that you can't cope. Yeah, we can't cope with all the cases. We've we've got way too many. Uh, just cost wise, it's impossible to to employ enough people to to oversee the matters. And remember, we we make sure that we attend every single court appearance, whether it's postponement or not, just to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. So you have to be everywhere. And 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 even if it takes five years, six years, um, we continue until we have come to the end, completely closed the entire case. Everything's done to the point where we have no influence anymore whatsoever. Um, this is the this is the question, and I don't have an answer for it, Chris. The 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 in in short, people that can't afford private help only have organisations like ours, and there there's a handful of uh, of of non profit organisations in South Africa that that do this, and otherwise they are literally surrendered, and I say surrendered because they've got no other option to just wait for the state and that they hope that for some other reason that one out of ten that that number one murder is going to be there what advice can you give to people like that who have uh, who do not have the re- resources to engage a private investigator and and, and, and maybe not even have the ability to get to someone like you maybe not even taxi fare to go to the police station to get what what can they do for themselves? Uh, to try and and improve the chances of justice? I think there are two things. I, th- I think the first one is that they need to speak. Speak, 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 speak. Ma- make it known. Expose corruption. Say their names. Uh, and, I, and I say this carefully because I would have previously said, no, be, be careful. But it doesn't help to be careful in South Africa anymore. If you don't say it, if you don't expose and embarrass um, uh, those that are corrupt and criminal, then nothing happens. Nothing. No one takes it seriously. At the business conference of, uh, a few months ago, I uh, I showed a picture of a gangster posing in a uh, in a police vehicle in the Cape Flats. The captain whose vehicle that was that that is in cahoots with those gangs. After I exposed that uh, um, that matter, you know what the police did? They only put him on special leave for a month and then returned to work. Nothing changed. No one was arrested. And, and and so even speaking out is not always enough, but the point is I'm going to continue speaking. And the more of us start doing that and we don't just sit back, the better. And But I must add that this also goes um, with regards to cops and prosecutors and other authorities that do a good job. We need to say that too. We need to give credit where credit is due because it's too easy just to criticize, but some of them do remarkable work and we need to say that too. But in my opinion, that's the first one is to speak. The second one that is that is crucial to me is communities need to organize themselves. They need to have community safety structures to be preventative. It's the only way that we're going to do this. We need to accept that we have to undergo a lifestyle change in South Africa that we can't just rely on the state. The state dependency mindset needs to change. We cannot wait for government to fix things or to change things. There is so much that we can do within the framework of the law in South Africa. And people will say to me, but why do I pay tax? Well, tough, then move. Um, We need to keep them accountable. But at the same time, we need to do something ourselves. We need to roll up our sleeves. We need to start working. Otherwise, there's no role for you to play here because things aren't going to change overnight, especially if we're going to wait for government. What are some of the worst uh, cases that you have come across um, of injustice? Oh, so there's a few. Um, I've actually got a list of cases here, or the, or the, or the ones that uh, that motivate me. I've got a list in front of the, the uh, on a board. I'll actually send you a picture of it, of about uh, eight or nine cases that really stick out. The one that we're very busy with at the moment is the one of Sipokazi Boy, 
um, uh, absolutely horrific case. She was, uh, she was. Before I say what happened to her, so so she was, uh, you know, at first in a in a very abusive relationship. Um, her boyfriend was well known as a, as a man called Rasta and Bukweni, close to Paul in the Western Cape, and uh, and he kept on beating her. And uh, in August of 2021, he beat her to the point where she uh, uh, she she was unrecognizable. You could not recognize her. Her face was swollen like. Well, I've actually never seen someone beaten like that. Of all the hundreds, well, actually thousands of matters that we've attended to, I've never seen someone beaten this way. And this is, yeah, without going into too much detail, she was then uh, managed to escape from his shack when he passed out. She pretended to be uh, passed out. And when he fell asleep, she escaped through a window. Um, she was admitted to hospital and he was arrested for the, the offense. And then guess what? The police didn't oppose bail. And he was released. He then kidnapped her, took her to his shack. He then uh, beat her again. He allegedly kicked her in her stomach uh, until she was dead. Now, to kick someone in their stomach until you're dead uh, must be... Uh, I can't even imagine it. Um, and then he dismembered her. Um, he cut off parts of her breasts. Sorry, this is a very, it's very graphic. Um, and then he put her in a trolley bin, in a wheelie bin, and uh, the, the remains, and then he took her to the train track. That's about 200, 250 meters from where his shack was, and he set the bin alight. Um, at first, when the community found the burning bin and the remains were removed, they thought it was a child because the body was so short, but it was because of the dismembering. And this whole horrific story, um, what, what got to me yesterday when we met with the family again, was that when a younger sister was asked if she would want to speak or say something about it, she just broke down. And then we found out that she was actually the one that went to look for Sipukazi when she was kidnapped the last time by Rasta. And when she looked through a hole in the in the shack, he suddenly appeared in front of her and he said to her, if you come here again, I'm going to kill you along with Sipukazi. And that was the last time she, uh, she saw what seemed to be Sipukazi uh, in the shack. Um... That that case, I think, speaks uh, speaks volumes. A, a, a less serious case, uh, in in the sense that the person survived, is the is the case that we recently actually put a police officer behind bars. Is the case of Camelia Bayers in uh, in Kharting. Uh She was kidnapped by her also abusive uh, boyfriend. He uh, she tried to end their relationship. He then kidnapped her and he wanted to take her to an abandoned space in the East Rand where he wanted to execute her. And uh, she managed to put up quite a scene after he had beaten her very, very badly uh, in the vehicle. And passing by police, they tried to pull him over. He then resisted when they eventually got him out of the car. Um, I'm shortening some of the ordeal. And they arrested him. The horrific part was she went to the hospital. And uh, when she returned the next morning, after waiting more than 24 hours just to get medical attention, uh, at a at a state facility, when she got to the police station, um, all still bloodied up and everything, they said no, he was released. They withdrew the charges. She said how? She said, no, someone came and made a statement. She says but that's impossible. It's the first time I've come to the station. And then, luckily, the station commander showed up and he said, but there's something wrong here. And we then got involved, followed up the case. Long story short, the, it was a Metro police officer who was her ex-boyfriend, and he was friends with some of the cops. And they, um, uh, they, they, they made a false statement, and according to that, they then released it. Uh, now, apart from the fact that, that the firearm was involved, um, you know, it, it just astounds me that, that someone is beaten to pulp, and then you can just release it. And then I think the last one, that's a case that's that's very close to my heart because of um, the age of the little girl, is the case of Mia Buerta. It's also a Western Cape case that we're working with at the moment. Um, and uh, we, we, we're very close to her parents. Um, she was murdered last year uh, uh, at the age of four. I think what got me about it, and this is just on a personal level, is when I got to, when I went to visit the parents the day after they found her body, was the clothes that were hanging on the washing line are exactly the same type of clothes that my daughter would wear. So my daughter is also four years old. 
and uh, it just hit me. I just thought this could have been my my little girl, and it's less than ten kilometers from where I live. Um, and uh, and and then once we started following up uh, with regards to the police investigation, there was so much that just stood out. Firstly, the police weren't kicking down doors to find Mia before she was killed. They weren't kicking down doors to find the perpetrator after the body was was found. In fact. They sent public order policing units to patrol the streets in case the, the community would start protesting because of the murder that had occurred. And several days after that, while we were working in the area with the family, with the relatives, etc., etc., the police were still patrolling the area in case the, the, the community would start rioting. And I'm like, who are you policing here? Are you policing criminals? Or are you policing people that are fed up with your incompetence? And to this day, there's been no arrest. Um, I have it on good authority now that, that the police are actually making some progress and, and that there is involvement of, of other uh, officers and officials. But the amount of fighting we have had to do just to get some kind of, of response, it's just, it's immense. And, uh, and also, you know, several times that, that the family is implicated, wrongly implicated, um, and uh, it, it really makes it challenging. Just lastly about that, uh, Chris, is like on the crime scene of, of Mia, they didn't cordon off the crime scene. That crime scene was contaminated so badly. Um, uh, it's it's alleged that there was a, a, a plastic bag. You know the bags that you buy bread in? Yeah. Um, one of those bags was, was in her mouth or in her throat, and one of the cops pulled it out. Um, you know, And, and it, it, basic things like that, that just that just frustrates me to the point where where I think to myself, but if if we can do this as a as a as a civil rights body, if we can do it properly, but also with a lack of resources, um, why can't you just do the basics right? Those are things that don't take time. It's just having compassion and doing the basic things right. Ian, um, what drives you personally to fight for justice as hard as you are? fighting for it so for me uh, personally um i i believe god uh gave me an an opportunity to uh to to make an impact so um uh, that god motivates me and i i stand firm with that i've gone through a lot of times where i say to my wife what gives us hope and the only thing that i hold on to is jesus so so that um that that really is is my foundation um i think what what also motivates me, um, and it's a bit of a, it, it might be a bit of a negative motivation, but what also motivates me is is the fact that I see so little men speaking out, stepping forward, and say we have to be custodians of everything that has been given to us. If if we've got a community, we need to be guardians and custodians of that community. We need to protect people. We need to uh, speak out if there's injustice. If someone is being abused in front of me, I'm not meant to take out my phone and take a video of it for TikTok. I'm meant to step in and say, don't abuse this person. Um, that is the, the role that I see more men need to play. And I honestly believe, and people can disagree with me, I know there's so many debates and things in the, in the modern world now about gender and all of that. I don't even want to get into it. I don't even understand half of it. I just know that um, South Africa would be a very different place if if more people, not just men, if more people just stepped up in times when they could. If they go to court, if they attend the hearing, if they speak up as witnesses, I know there's intimidation. We face it every single day, um, but I don't uh, I don't buy the fact that that outweighs the the calling that we have to to bring justice. Well, Ian, thank you very, very much for speaking to us and, and thank you for giving hope to people who have lost hope. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm.